Feet down, let me just straighten my chair up. And um, it's not right to, to, to start off with. And just rubbing your hands together. Fingers, palms of your hands get a little bit warm. <clears throat> Tapping over your face. Over your head and neck. Down to one shoulder. And your arms. Side. Off your chest. Down to your belly. And then sitting back. So I'm in this posture. You automatically go to a, what I would term a, a, <coughs> me, a reclining position. Actually, if I, if I turn my chair around, I've arranged it carefully for you, but now changing that. Move it back a bit. With your feet out like this, you can you can sit back and put point of contact. So it's sort of like somewhere in your back, depends on the height of the chair back and your own height. Hips, lower back, buttocks, that, that kind of area. A little bit of weight in your, your, your heels as well. That's not that, that significant, but in the, your, your upper body, just trying to relax in those areas. And I think last time I, I described it as though you're flopping back in the chair. Clearly, there's a little bit more to it than, than that. But actually, this, this feeling of the, the, this sort of... Uh, just, just dropping back and to, to, to coin a phrase of letting go, simply allowing yourself to, to, to drop into the chair is an important sort of first stage, I think, as we, as, as we prepare for the, for, for, for the sessions or practice sessions. Just allowing the strength of the chair to register with you so that you're, you're comfortable, you're confident in, in, in the chair. You know, if, if you if you went to visit somebody and you sat in their chair and it felt a bit creaky, you wouldn't be quite, you wouldn't be able to sort of like let go of that tightness. You'd always be just a little bit, is, it, is the chair going to collapse underneath me? Whereas if it was a good solid chair, much more likely to, 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 to settle back into it. It also has to be the right kind of shape and size for you, of course. But it's, a, it's just a very simple way of understanding the significance of, structures that, that we use, our posture in, in, in other words. So when you bring your feet back in, you, you could stay back like that, but actually you're more likely to want to come forwards just, just a little bit. So you know, find the position in, in, in the chair. Always remember when we're thinking about posture, that the ideas about posture, the ideals about postures that, that we take need need to be held up against what's appropriate for you at the, at, at, at the moment. So I suppose you could say the ideal posture for doing these chair-based exercises is with your weight a little bit forwards, a slight angle there, um, your back supported by your hips and your feet um, and able to maintain this, this upright structure. But if you start to get a little bit stiff in your back, then there's, there's, don't don't grin and bear it. Sit back and rest. Remember that everything in Tai Chi is done with that release of tightness and stiffness. So if you've got to the point where the muscles are tired and they've started to, stiff, to stiffen up, sit back. So most chairs, most chairs, that will mean that that you've got the lower part of the back against the, the the chair. You're still just just a little bit forward, but mostly that will suffice to. Um, give you a, a little bit of support. So 
be prepared to change your position as, as and when you need to. But once again, get some kind of sense of confidence, obviously in the chair that you're in, but also in, in your posture, that your feet and your hips, and your posture overall, and that sense of what's going on within the body, think of your skeleton, are capable of actually holding you up without you having to strain, without you having to stiffen. So if you imagine, for instance, that your spine is part of a, a column going up through your body, to your head resting on top of that column, and you allow the column to support you, you no longer need to hold on to stiffness in the belly or your chest or your back or your shoulders. You automatically get more space in your, your body when that happens. A comparable feeling would be if you put a pair of shoes on, especially a new pair of shoes, and they're a little bit stiff. When you take them off again, it's almost like your feet open out a, a little bit. And it's that kind of feeling throughout your upper body when, when the posture begins to work for you. So things like your breathing, your circulation, everything really, all, all the kind of metabolic processes depend to a greater or lesser extent on movement. And more space means less restricted movement, less effort having to be put into to, to the movement. So we're cultivating a posture that allows the natural functions of your body to happen with less restriction. And that would include the flow of energy through your body. So then just beginning to move, that feeling of the posture should stay with you in the back of your mind. When it's not there and you feel that you've lost it, you can just take a moment to come back to it. Inevitably, we do lose it. And it has a massive impact on how we're moving, the quality that we move with, the flow that we move with. So there's a direct link between the characteristic flow in Tai Chi and our posture, our physical structure. And then hands in front of your shoulders. Another outcome of this good posture is that your body quite naturally displays qualities of connection. So here, for instance, as you circle your elbows around, Focus a little bit on what's happening in your chest and your ribs, what's happening in your upper back, shoulder blades and the area between them, what's happening in the sides. And then going forward. It's almost impossible, I think, to move one part of your body without getting some part of response from, from elsewhere. And again, that's both, if you like, a, a mechanical connection, you know, different muscles connecting with each other through tendons and the ligaments and so on and so forth. Take, take your hands out, bring your hands out to your sides. And let's explain the same thing, what's happening in the chest and upper back. But it's also in, in the nature of the, the movement itself, the, if you like, the energy. So if you were to get a balloon and blow it up, and if you could somehow record the pressure around the, the, the outside of the balloon in various places, and then you just pressed one finger in, in one part of the balloon, you could probably record the change in pressure all the way around the balloon, in all parts of the balloon. And it's the same in, in the body, that fluidity that exists within the body is, is another aspect of continuity, shall we call it, through the body. And then winding around. If you ride a bike and you've ever managed to bend a spoke, there's a little buckle, it actually throws the whole wheel out. It's, it's, it's the same kind of idea.
to observe the movement. Train your attention to focus on these very subtle changes within your body. And then easing forwards and then sinking back. Remember, your hips stay back. It's like somebody sitting behind you in the chair, pulling you back into the chair by your bow. And at the same time, imagine somebody very gently just taking hold underneath your skull and pulling you slightly. So as you go forward, the spine just opens up and contracts the spaces between the vertebrae, expanding very, very slightly. Not just the spaces, but I mean, you know, there's little muscles between the vertebrae and they'll just reach a point where they contract and help to pull you back. And generally speaking, we start to really appreciate this spaciousness between the vertebrae, helps the spine to open up. And once again, our, our posture reflects this. The chin pulls in very slightly. Try and avoid coming back to the upright position by kind of pulling your head back. It's like you're trying to hold a ball underneath the chin. And in the more upright position, when we settle back down here, we experience a little bit of a lift through the back of the head, through the, the, the ridge of bone there, just above the neck. So now you've got a two-way movement. You've got an upward lift pulling the top of your spine up. You've got your hips sinking down, drawing the spine down. Described by the, in, 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 by the Chinese theory in Tai Chi as a, like having a, a pearl necklace, a string of pearls. And if you imagine you've got, you've got a necklace with beads of one kind or another, if it's pearls, they're very valuable. And you just gently pull at either end. You don't wrench it out. This isn't a kind of big, aggressive movement against your back, you'll just gently pull out and the necklace would get straighter and the beads would separate the spaces between them. Our spine shouldn't be completely straight. There are natural curves in, in the spine, but they'll often get quite shallow as you, you get that opening. And then turning and, and forwards and backwards. What this amounts to in, in kind of energetic terms and in terms of how we feel is that rather than forcing ourselves into an upright position, taking the, the correct posture, you know, aligning hips and tucking, letting the pelvis tuck under, drawing the chin in and so on, actually gives us this longer, taller feeling without us having to actively try to produce it in the back. And then in the other direction. This has a profound effect energetically, but also on how we feel about ourselves. It was just saying, horrible weather, gray skies, damp, cold. You sort of like you hunch over, don't you? <laughs> and then going around. But actually, particularly when we come to the middle, but really all the way through these exercises, we have this sense of our head, as one of my teachers described, the head floating up and a much more open quality without you having to really strain for it. Because if you have to strain for it, you'll quickly get exhausted by it. And we also get that sense of our spine moving within our body, floating within our body. And then back in the other direction. These are all qualities that we want to try and maintain going through the different exercises. And of course, qualities that we want to try and bring in to the standing part of the class. It's good to practice these in the chair, simply because there's less likelihood that you're going to strain in your, in, in, in your back with your own body weight because you're in the chair. And then just coming back and settling down. 
So feeling your hips sinking into the chair, another feeling that we want to take into every action that we take. Let your hips drop down and imagine a seesaw, your hips dropping down and at the other end of the seesaw, the heels of your feet. And so one heel comes up as your hips drop down and then you can step out. Some of you may remember me talking about the opposite movements that we find all the way through this. So if we're going to move forward, there's a movement backwards and so on and so forth. And then ultimately, all those opposite movements go down into the ground. And then on the other side. It's a very definite step. We plant the foot. And just you probably come out of position a little bit. I know I have. So let's come back to come back to sitting. So hands down by your sides. Oh, that's it, just slips right out of position, this chair. Yeah. It takes time as I'm doing, to <laughs> make sure you're in the right position in the chair. So, hands down to your sides, and then easing forwards and pushing back with this rotation of your arms. Now, if I, if I do this from the side, I can only do it with one arm. But here, you see my arm is hanging down from my shoulder, and it remains hanging down from my shoulder. What I'm not doing is getting to here and going to there. So one of the reasons for doing this is to, just to get a sense for how much movement, how much energy is in your arm without you having to do all of this. So one of the things that we want to try and do is as we go into the other exercises, think of your arms providing the shape for the movement. The movement's already there. You don't have to do a great deal with, 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 with your arms beyond just giving, giving the movement a shape to flow into. As you go forward, you remember that feeling of your hips sinking back. As you come back to the more upright position, reinforce that with just a moment to allow the settling. So that's part of the, the background noise almost, background awareness that we bring to the movement. But then at this point, we're going to change the fisherman cast net. Go back. If you imagine doing this in water, your arms are held back a little bit. So now the pelvis tilts, your shoulders go forwards, drawing on your elbows, your elbows drawing on your wrists. And still aware of what's happening in your chest, your upper back. Building the movement up, if you want your arms to move further, really working with those movements in chest and upper back rather than straining in your arms and your shoulders. Also moving more in, in, in the center of your body, really getting this movement of your weight, which is the principal driving, <coughs> excuse me, driving force. And just allowing the momentum that naturally builds your arms swinging like pendulums, making sure that you're not stiffening up in your shoulders or your arms, which would block that momentum building. And above all else, not straining in your upper body, just letting the movement build in its own time.
and then went over. So you've got a ball in front of you, just draw it, or pulling the ball, rolling the ball in towards your chest. Again, just be aware of what you're doing with your arms. Your arms are for a moment or two held in position here. You're not lifting your hands. <clears throat> Once again, if I show you from the side, that angle between your arm and your body remains the same. So as my hips drop back, as my feet push me back, my hand would just change position and it will come up nice and smoothly as opposed to trying to lift the arm. So this can help make us aware of certain functions in a body that come out of that feeling of connection. A little bit later, we're going to start using those connections, but these early exercises, I think, make make those aspects of Tai Chi very explicit, is why I start with them. Now, let your hands come up, turn them palm in, feel your chest open in, upper back closing, so your shoulder blades are sliding towards each other and then drawing apart. Vision spreads its wings. For a slightly more connected and a slightly stronger movement, imagine as you go back that you've got sort of a thick elastic band between the wrists. So you've got to really draw apart there. And as you come forward, like there's a ball there, and you're just squeezing the ball in a big ball. So both of those images will encourage more than just your arms involved in the movement, feeling the expansion up through your belly, into your ribs, and then contracting downwards. It may also have an impact on the breathing because that opening from the belly up to your chest has the effect of, sometimes anyway, drawing the air down into your lungs like the bellows pumping a fire. One more time. And then pushing a wave. Here again, expanding belly up into your chest because your elbow is going out. Turn your hands and push them. Once again, try and resist the temptation to lift your hands. It's very common at this point for people to do this. So lift, their, lift their hands up. Again, from the side, notice the shape of my arm. Yeah, so there, because it's held in this shape, if I swing my arm forwards, it's going to curve up. So this is really the same action as um, fisherman cast the net. C keep going with the exercise, but watch what I'm doing as much as you can. If I wanted to do fisherman cast the net, I let my hand hang down. I'm doing the same in my legs, in my chest, in my upper back, causing this swinging movement from the shoulder. If I want to do pushing away, I simply bend my elbow. A little bit more to it than that. The elbow does go out a little bit and doesn't come right back. But what I'm not doing is feeling that I have to somehow lift my hand up. So again, by changing the shape that our arms are in, we, we come to a, a very sort of distinct movement from fisherman cast the net. And just by its nature, the, the suggestion of the name and the feeling of pushing against something, a stronger movement, not because the arms have suddenly gotten stronger, but because the whole body is being used behind the movement.
And then for the next change, punch with both fists here, a loose fist. Here your elbows don't go out, but there is this very strong rotation in each arm. Again, feeling what's happening in your chest and your upper back. Same action in your hips and the movement of your weight. Pretty much the same in your chest and your upper back, a little bit smaller than previous movements. So simply by changing, in a sense, the shape of your arm, you've given yourself, once again, a very different movement. So this time, going back to pigeon spreads its wings, and just feeling those changes. Change in image, change in the shape of the arm, a change in your intent. Maybe a little bit of a change in how much of a movement you feel in chest and upper back. So a small effort, a small change in what I've been describing is the shape of your arms can actually have quite a big effect. It's another example of, of the idea behind this phrase that we use in Tai Chi, the four ounces will move a thousand pounds. And another example also of the economy of movement that we make use of in Tai Chi. Still in the back of your mind, the sense of the overall posture, chin pulled in, remember, feeling the, the pull at both ends of your spine hips sinking down into the ground, and into the chair rather, but eventually the ground of course. Do this little set one more time. So not only will this emphasize the economy of the movement, but it will also lead us to an awareness of really key principles that underpin all of the movements, posture, moving from the center, and so on and so forth. But this time, turning your hands out, a little bit more active in a sense, a bit more complex with your arms. But again, let your hands drop down, through the chest opening and just let the hands come in to a point in front of your hips. Take that same shape that you would use for pushing a wave. And then change into polishing the table, hands palm down, turning, feeling of your hips dropping back, drawing you back into the chair.
as you do this, you're probably quite automatically thinking that you know here, maybe you know, your body's turning to the right and then to the left and so on and so forth. But just consider for a moment the fact that the rear of your body and your back, your hips are moving the opposite way. So we might say left or right, but actually the truth is your body's moving in all directions. And that just changes your perspective slightly, give you a more holistic view of your body. You're not quite so fixed on what's happening in the front of your body. Remember when one part of your body is in motion, the whole body is part of that movement. And this time, turning your hand palm down and your hips pushing downwards, your feet pushing downwards. And once again, a sort of holistic sense. It's not one movement. It's your body expanding in all directions. If, you, if your body was like, a, again, a balloon, when you blow into a balloon, this is one of these funny novelty balloons, but it's an ordinary round balloon. You blow into it, it expands in all directions. So the expansion of your, of your body is downwards towards the ground, upwards towards the sky above you, sideways, forwards and backwards. We have all those options and we choose to follow the upward and downward movement for this exercise. Perhaps like a, a sailor would, you know, faced with several ways of steering the boat through, and through a kind of river estuary or something like that. There are various channels that you could use, and depending on various circumstances, you might choose one or the other. The circumstances here obviously depends on which exercise you're doing. And then your hands out to your sides for the wild goose. As always, these smaller, more economic or subtle movements and connections running through our body are often the ones that are more likely to be affected by something happening in our mind, an image or an idea, a memory. They're often quite small movements. And they're also the movements, they're also the, the, the connections that are quite often those areas that touch is known to reach skeletal muscle, postural muscle, tendons, ligaments, the fascia, and the interactions between them. And then part in the clouds. So some of those changes you can feel in back and front and the sides of your body as your arms move will be muscular. Maybe you know, here, for instance, you may feel the, the muscles and the connective tissue between, between your ribs just opening out a little bit here. Again, that might encourage your breathing. Some will be more to do with the connective tissue itself, the fascia, for instance, the muscle skin. So I, I get a strong sense of that in my sides, I think, when my arms go up. But nothing is ever totally isolated, remember. So these are just bullet points that we notice, aspects of the inner landscape that we suddenly become aware of against the background of the whole landscape. You're still aware of you know, the movement of your weight from feet to hips, the constant feeling of your hips settling down, that softness in buttocks, hips, lower back, allowing that. One more time with this exercise. And then hands dropping down, dragon plucks the stars from the sky.
60% of your weight back in your hips. So 30 to 40% in your feet or two thirds and a third if you prefer. But that will move a little bit. That will change a little bit because each time you go to push your arm up, a little bit of pressure down through your feet, a little bit of pressure down through, through your hips. So you could imagine that as two waves, one going forwards from your hips, one going back from your feet, meeting in, in the middle. When if you watch, if you go to the beach and watch the waves playing around, when they meet, they tend to push up. So we get that upward movement. One more time. And then bringing the hands in, pushing up. And there. Remember that lovely open feeling in the spine. And as your feet push down and as the hips push down, it's almost like the combination pushes your head up very slightly, creating a slightly longer feeling up and down your spine. A lovely, smooth massaging quality through the whole of your back. Remember that that sense of your head going up is also connected to the feeling of your hips going downwards a little bit. Do one more round of this. Extend one foot, again, a little bit of weight in your heel, knee bent, so not, not fully extended tilting forwards and again the hips dropping back into the chair to draw the head and the shoulders up and allow for this expansion in the front of your body scooping the sea and looking at the sky very loose feeling in the shoulders, don't strain in your shoulders, and your arms, bring your arms up. As with rolling the ball in, a lot of this movement is the arms simply staying in position, and then the chest opens. One more time. And think about how we make the change to grasping the tiger's ears. Bring your hands down, keep the leg extended, but do a as though you're doing a version of bird folds its wings. Same kind of idea, your arms hanging down, feeling the movement in your chest and your upper back. And then roll your fingers into a hollow fist. Don't grip tightly because you'll block this movement. Still the same rotation of your arms. And then sort of combining it in a way with the idea behind fishermen cast the net, just letting your arm lag behind slightly. And then finally, to get to the full movement, a little bit of a push up from your hips here. If I exaggerate, it's like my head goes up, my shoulders go up, and that draws my arms up into the movement, grasping the tiger's ears. Again, given us this sense of the components of the movement. And when they start to work together, as they do, as we become more aware of them, we realize that what can actually be quite a difficult movement for the shoulders, this one, actually is it just this lovely, smooth, quite bold movement, grasping the tiger's ears. So now change into the other side. 
scooping the sea, looking at the sky, hips dropping back, remember. And even as you go forwards, feeling that pull backwards in, in the chair means that there's only so far you can go. They act as a sort of restrainer, which means hopefully you're not going to fall out your chair. Now we make the change into grasping the tiger's ears. Just build it up in stages as we did before. Give the rotation. Make sure, curl your fingers in. Make sure as you make the fist, you're not having a, a, a negative effect on that rotation. So you haven't gripped tightly, still soft in your wrists, soft in your elbows. And then feeling that push up, the lengthening of, of, of your back. Gradually, like an expansion up through your back, through your belly, through your chest. So your arms were just being lifted up by a wave in the sea. Grasping the tiger's ears. Don't get fanatical about getting your hands to this position in line with your ears. You know, if it's tighten your back or something like that, you'll block the very movement that is likely to produce that. So you, know, you could do it lower still. One more time. And then bring your feet in. In a moment, just to feel yourself settling. We always come back to this. You could argue that each time we bring the weight back, we take a moment let the hips sink. So just rubbing your hands together. And then tapping over your face. Over your head and neck. And to one shoulder and your arm. The other side. Upper part of the chest. The belly. And your legs. And then pump in the foot. So just push one heel up. Getting the muscles of your legs working and then go around in a circle. Still your hips sinking back. On the other side, up and down, first of all. And then going around. And rest. You want a sensation of movement downwards. So your lower back, your hips, your buttocks, almost like water slowly draining down. And if you pay attention, it's simply recognizing the effect of the pull of gravity on your hips. And just notice crucially that actually you're not having to bend your knees anymore to allow that to happen. Your knees are bent because you're sitting in a chair, but it's this, Willingness to get a sense of releasing in that, that whole area of, of, of your, your, your lower back that allows a free flow for the pull of gravity through that area, through your whole body, really. But I wanted to focus on that, that area there. So, standing. So, rather than thinking, oh, I must bend my knees to root down, because it doesn't necessarily mean the same. Recognize that you know, when, when, when you align your, your, your body, we want that same feeling of yielding, of movement downwards through hips and lower back and buttocks. And we want to just gently yield to that. So 
we just let the hips drop back. And in the process of doing that, obviously there'll be a slight bend in your, your knees. So it's not that it's not that we hold the knees stiff. That 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 wouldn't work at all. But rather than thinking bend the knees to drop the hips, get a feeling of your hips dropping, exactly the same feeling as, as you, you just had in the chair, hope, hopefully. Now, we do go down deeper at times, and there's various reasons for that. One important reason is to condition the legs. But this is what we want. This is the position we want to be doing the washing up in and standing in the supermarket queue and standing at the bus stop. Not this. This, this is a position that will help you to develop this, this posture. There's other reasons as well. But you know, go, th th think, think of it in that way. Change your intent. And then just let your hips drop back a little bit more and down, bring your hands around in front of you. Your legs will automatically push you up when you've gone down far enough. Try and avoid this happening. See how my knees have gone forwards there. There, what we're looking for is, see there, my knees, I can look down, I still see my toes poking out beyond my knees. There's very much to hit. There'll be a little bit of forward and backwards movement probably in, in your knees, just not from there to there. It's just very slight. So don't strain against that, but just make sure it's not going too far. Change into the wild goose. So it's quite challenging to remain aware of what's happening in your hips, in your lower body, and indeed in the whole of your bodily landscape while you're doing particular exercises. For me, the wild goose is always problematic because I do like to go out and watch the wild geese flying around. So I'm apt to get a bit distracted by the image. I want to try and avoid that if I possibly can. And then part in the clouds. And that nice open feeling up through the back of your head. So all these ideas are there to change our perspective on how we're moving, to change the intent behind the movement and make us more aware of these subtle changes within the body. And to take our attention deeper. Lovely. Okay. And then one foot forward, making sure of our stance, wide enough and long enough to get some kind of movement, transferring your weight. Now, you could do this in a much deeper stance, and it's worth doing that after a while. Once your muscles can do this, by all means, drop your hips more, but just make sure that it's within the capabilities of your muscles. Because if your muscles tighten, if I tighten, my front leg, watch what happens to my, actually, I do it in the back there, you can see better. I get there, if the muscle is stiff, see what's happened, I've suddenly, I can suddenly feel the pressure there and, and, and in my ankles. So we gradually build this. It's good to go to the deeper stances for various reasons. But the deeper stances are achieved through dropping the hips more. And then just raising your toes and your heel. Aware of the pull of gravity. We don't even have to try to drop the hips. It shouldn't be a problem to drop your hips. It can be, it is, we know that, but it shouldn't be, should it? Yeah, keep going, but just, you know, if I pick up this convenient little cushion there, you know, this little cushion, nothing special. Don't even know what it's doing there actually, but it was there. So that if I if I if I let go of it, it drops. I haven't had to struggle for that. I haven't had to 
slow it down or push it or use any secret technique, which is just as well, so I don't know any. Stepping in now, I just simply let go. Difficult to do. And we, this brings us back to, are we confident in the structure of our body? Can we feel that, you know, the alignment of our body with the pull of gravity, the skeleton and so on and so forth are sufficient just to allow that, that, that slight drop in. As always, the wall is your friend. If you're a bit kind of, oh, I'm not sure about this, it's understandable. The wall there can just give you that little bit of support to help you build that, that, that confidence. And then on the other side, Be careful. I when mean, I said about we're going, you can go down deeper, but if you're going to do that, just do it for a couple of movements to, be, to begin with. The more you let go in your hips, the more work you're going to do with, with your muscles and tendons and ligaments, but principally the muscles. And then raising your toes and your heel. Stepping in. And then just stepping through whichever direction you have the space for. And when you get to this position here, if you're feeling a bit wobbly, that's no good. Put the toes down. Just give yourself that little bit of reassurance. And that will help you to drop your hips. If you don't, if you don't really need that, try, you know, try just a foot off the ground. But my toes went down automatically there because I started to wobble. And then going back. This isn't meant to be a competition to see if you can take the step without ever having to put your foot down. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But you know, can we find that sense of stability? Good. Now, just a few rounds of fisherman cast the net. Can we maintain that awareness that we're building in the, the walking and the stepping, the transfer of the weight, while we're also trying to think about creating that shape with our arms. We want to just work on that awareness of the inner landscape of the body so that we're not so caught up in one detail that it blocks out everything else. And then on the other side. Remember to keep in the, the, the sense of the overall structure of your body. Everything sort of, in a sense, comes out of that. Good. And then just bring your feet down, <clears throat> shake out. So go back to your chair. So it is worth 
looking for the deeper stances, you also get more of a sense of energy coming up from them. Um, but do so carefully and, and, and don't think that's the be all and end all in, in Tai Chi practice. It isn't. The, um, a good friend and mentor of mine, a woman called Linda Broder, unfortunately no longer with us, but she was a fantastic Tai Chi player. Um, and she worked really hard at it. She was very well known, Linda. Um, and she'd been doing Tai Chi about 25 years when she was invited out to Taiwan by somebody she knew to work with this guy's teacher, which was a great honor for her. Um, and she spent five days in Taiwan with this guy, five days. So she'd been doing Tai Chi for 25 years at that point. She was a great player of the art. Um, I was working with Linda a great deal around that time. Um, and um, after she came back, she was obviously kind of had lots to, to teach. And I remember working with her on a number of occasions at different events and things like that. And she would always tell the same stories about what, what happened out there. And one of the key things she mentioned was how the guy had talked a lot about not bending the knees, but dropping the hips. And then she would point, it was summer, we were all wearing shorts. She would point to that muscle there, which is one of the ones that gets worked in Tai Chi and point out that in five days, working on dropping the hips after 25 years of doing Tai Chi, the muscle had doubled in size and it was no lie. <laughs> So, um, well, you know, it's, if it had been just her bending her knees, she probably would have come back saying, oh, my knees really hurt, <laughs> if you see what I mean. It's, it's this action here, this dropping down there. And when I do this, I'm going to sit into the chair, but in the same way I sit into the hips. You can't do that without the structure. If I go to sit in the chair, one of the things that I do is I make sure the chair's there. And we do that quite, quite, quite automatically. We, we, we make sure that there is a structure there to, to, to hold us. So I'm gonna sit down there. <laughs> Again, just feeling that letting go in your hips, lower back, buttocks. And from that, if, if you do that, it's like taking taking the plug out of a sink when there's water in it everything else will, will drain away so let your hands drop down and then pushing out bringing your arms around embrace tiger return to mountain letting go in hips and lower back feeling your shoulders drop putting yourself drawn back to whatever this image of the mountain evokes for you in terms of Physically, your body settling, quietening, the mind coming back to that still point. Something that is triggered perhaps by that feeling of movement down through your hips and your willingness just to, to yield to that. and rest. And as you rest, hip sinking back, drawing your chin in, feel that slight lift up and feel that opening up in your spine and your, your, your upper body once again. Enjoy that lovely open quality that we get when that happens. <laughs> lovely, thank you very much, everybody. I think that lovely open quality is a great an antidote to cold, gray, January days.
So Thank you, Mike. That was, very, that was very helpful. Just what I needed. Good, good. Well, just, just remember, you don't have to strain for it. You have to let go to get it, which is, which is counterintuitive, isn't it? Uh, 